uh, my name is Galen Emery, and I'm here to talk about uh, the Human Free Software Factory or the Human Free Pipeline, uh, as I like to talk about it. Um, the basic idea is let's remove the humans from production. Viva la robots. Before I get started, uh, I do not have 45 minutes of content here. So if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A structure so that I can have uh, some time to answer them. I would love to have a discussion with people uh, as we get towards the end of this uh, presentation. All right, so uh, who am I? Why am I talking about this? I've worked at Shift Software for six, six and a half years uh, now. I am based in San Diego. I used to travel a lot before 2020. Uh, I have not been on, our, on an airplane since March which is by far the longest time I've not gone on an airplane in my professional career. Uh, I am the lead compliance and security architect. So I focus on the compliance and security products for Chef, but also specifically around compliance and security problem space around DevOps and DevSecOps. Uh, I've been both a pre-sales and post-sales customer architect um, at, at Chef in my time here. And then obviously uh, I'm not currently a global traveler. I am at home at San Diego. Uh, it's a very weird feeling, but uh, gonna get. I'll probably get used to it just about the time that COVID ends and I'm asked to get back on airplanes all the time. So it's gonna be a real fun transition going back. So what are we talking about today? Today we're talking about a couple of things, but basically why do humans suck at routine tasks? What are humans good at? What's better at routine tasks than a human? What can our automation actually prove from a security and compliance standpoint? And again, uh, please encourage you to give me some Q&A questions so that I have something to talk about. So we don't just have dead space at the end of this uh, topic. If it's not clear yet, I don't have 45 minutes of content, people, so please ask me questions. I will happily answer them, and we can have a great discussion near the end of this. All right, so let's talk about what this is, what my definition is, and why we're talking about um, this idea. And this may be kind of old hat to some folks. Some folks may say, like, yeah, this makes a whole lot of sense. And other people are like, well, there's no way I could ever do this. But the basic structure is that we want to set up a rule and a structure such that humans do not perform any manual actions past committing to source code management. That's the structure of what we want to say when we're talking about the human free pipeline is to say, humans have zero interaction directly with production systems. They only interact with the code that builds those production systems. And why is this an important thing? Let's start with the, the stuff that humans suck at. We are really, really bad at repetitive tasks, particularly skilled workers. Um, we dislike them. I certainly hated them when I had to do data entry jobs uh, in college and then directly out of it. Um, we get bored, we get burnt out. Manual repetition has a potential for mistake, right? So you know, putting the same thing in 100 times, you make a mistake once. Uh, if you don't catch it then, then you have to go figure it out some other time. Um, and even muscle memory tasks have like, errors occasionally, right? Like, uh, you know, Anything from you know getting dressed in the morning, getting the you know wrong pant leg on, right, or two two legs in one pant, like like any of those things, we can we can run into these problems. So we definitely want to uh, to get away from routine tasks. And like, why is this actually bad? Like routine tasks, fine. Like we can go fix it. You know, it's it's really not a big deal. It's, it's Galen, it's the way it's always been done, right? Operations has always gone into production to make changes to systems. Well, if you dislike the work, you're less engaged. Also, if you have a manual change, you have manual fixes. If you have manual fixes, you end up in firefighting style operations. What I mean by that is that your game, your day is whack-a-mole. You know, go find the next step one, go resolve it, get back to it. You never get into that project work or you get very little project work uh, out of your time. If you have less engagement and, and a lot of firefighting, you get a lot of dislike and a lot of burnout. Um, I've been there. I've been in on-call situations with 24 hours on call, right? We've all, like, all of that sucks and, and adds up. If you dislike your job more, you're less engaged, and then the cycle continues, right? So you literally have a, uh, a self-defeating cycle that exists in traditional style operations, firefighting, manual operations, where we're always in production by ourselves, doing things live. Um, we're never really getting to this de uh, design, desired state view that we're really trying to get to in, in DevOps. And it's not just that we have a staff burnout problem, right? Operations and and production systems, the is all of the stuff we build in, in DevOps, all these things, they have a business purpose. There's a reason that we build these things. There's a reason that the companies employ us to do our jobs. And so we want to make sure that the things we're doing provide positive business value to the, to the company. And we're not seen as this cost center that has to be minimized and reduced and eliminated as much as possible. So we really want to focus on how do we make a positive business impact by, uh, by our work. And so I'm guided a lot by this quote from a manager of mine at a previous company. He looked at me one day, said, Galen, you aren't lazy. 
You just hate inefficiency. And my current manager would probably tell you that I am lazy, but you know, it's, it's, that's a different story. But the point being is that what's, what are the ways we can build an efficient system? How do we get better at managing this structure, managing this problem space? And so what are we actually good at as humans? Well, we're really good at design, we're really good at the new architectures, we're looking uh, at solutions to complex problems. We're looking really good at understanding the context of systems, right? Why does this thing exist? What is its purpose? What are we trying to do with it? Can we make it better? Um, do we need to optimize this function or do we not? Does it, is it not important, right? That's a really good human tax. Complexity, understanding the complexity of a system, understanding where we can reduce or eliminate complexity or where we, where we just have to manage it because it's irreducible in the structure of our, of our environment. And then collaboration, understanding those shared purposes and goals and working towards the business outcomes, right? These are the things that we as humans are fundamentally really good at of designing the problems to the, uh, designing the solutions to the problems, understanding the context of why the problem is important, understanding the complexity of it, and then collaborating with everybody in the company to make sure that we have an effective uh, uh, holistic solution, right? This is one of the key things of DevOps is about bringing developers and operations together. And then DevSecOps is, you know, security and we can do QA and, you know, we can continue to expand the bus. But the point being is that we're all here together to make the business effective, to make ourselves effective. And that's really where the humans are, are really effective, not in manually setting up DNS servers 100 times on 100 different servers. So if humans aren't good at repetitive tasks, but they are really good at writing and solving complex problems, what's the better way? Well, obviously we're in a DevOps track, so automation, right? DevOps is the, is the purpose of this, is what we're talking about today. And so what are the ways in which we've solved this historically, right? Well, if we go through the layers of configuration management, we have a pretty straightforward uh, scripting uh, is, is the first one, right? You know, okay, I, I wrote the thing in Bash or did, ran the commands in Bash or PowerShell, now I'm gonna write a script that just does it for me, goes in order, maybe I put some logic in there, so put some ifs, I can let it run, maybe some inputs, right? I can do all that kind of stuff on these scripts, but if you're just writing scripts, you have to manage them somehow, you have to move them from system to system when you need them. So you need some sort of configuration management tool that can orchestrate all of that, right? This is where tools like Terraform and Chef, and also Ansible and Puppet come into play, right? Really. Uh, making sure that we have a, a holistic understanding of, okay, this is the tasks that have to happen for the system. And some of these are better at desired state and, and defining that as code, and some of them are not. But the point being is that this is a you know, continual process. And then as we start getting things into, okay, let's get into the source code. Then we still run into the problem of, well, what happens when somebody goes into production and makes a change? How do we make sure we get that back into source code, right? All these things continue to tie in and continue to, to work together. So one of the things we can get to is this idea of code and system integrity. When we're thinking about audits and security and compliance in particular, there's a, there's a question that often shows up from our auditors of, well, how do you know the system is configured the way you say it's configured, right? How can you prove that information to me as an auditor or as a security or compliance uh, officer or, or professional? And so there's two things here that are really critical. There's integrity checks. Guess what? It's code. We have checksums. We have the ability to validate that the integrity of the code we ran on the system is the same code that's in our source code repository. It's the same code that ran through QA. We can validate those code, uh, that code in those packages really easily, really simply. We can use that to validate and say, hey, the thing that ran in production, I can prove to you it's the exact same thing that I ran in development, which means the results are going to be the exact same. And then we add that with a chain of custody. So we take that code, that secured uh, code that says, hey, I know what this thing is. I know what's inside of it. And we secure the pipeline. We say, we now say, hey, look, the only way that this code got to the system or these changes got to the system in question is through this pipeline. And I can prove to you the integrity of the pipeline because I'm going to remove human access from production. And this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about the human-free pipeline. We're saying literally take away SSH and WinRM, take away RDP, take away the ability for individuals to make production changes. And what this allows us to do is to say, I know the only way that system got built was the code. The code only got deployed through the pipeline. And I can prove to you that no human has ever logged into that box in order to tamper with it in, in the first place. This is a great time, by the way, for folks, if you have questions to start putting them into the Q&A, uh, because I guarantee you that I am going to run out of uh, content well before I run out of time. All right, so 
is the human free pipeline the thing I can buy? Is it a is a is an idea? Is it a thing? Like what what is this actual thing? How is this how does this actually work? Well, it really is just a set of design principles. It's just to say a couple of simple rules about the environment that we're going to operate in. The first is that human interaction should be with source code only. What this means is that if you need to make a change in production, you're not logging into a system of production. You are literally just going to the code, making a change, letting the pipeline do the rest. You need to secure the CDI and CD pipeline. You need to make sure that you have the appropriate guards in place to validate that uh, you know, only authorized users can commit code um, and that it's been peer reviewed and checked by appropriate professionals as we go through the process and that it's passed uh, security and functional tests. And then we need to uh, make sure we don't have any human access to production. So there's no way around the pipeline for anybody to make a change to production without going through the necessary controls and procedures. And the result is our only interaction available is with the source code, right? The only way that we can talk to the system is with source code. It's kind of a black box that happens between source code and production. And then the systems are updated in prod. And so what I'm talking about it from a kind of design perspective, this is really what we're talking about from, from a visual uh, component. Developers and operations folks, DevOps, right? Any of us really, we operate off of uh, uh, code commit. From a security perspective, we can put in two person rule at the very front. We can say, hey, look, if Galen committed code, Madeline has to approve it. Galen cannot approve his own code changes, right? Real simple rules to put in place. Really hard to enforce when you're talking about production SSH access, because it's really hard to validate without buying a bunch of very expensive uh, man in the middle and SSH, you know, uh, bastion host gear and force people to sit over the shoulder to really validate that, hey, Galen only did the things that he said he was gonna do or that we told him to do, unless you do a bunch of log things after the fact, but then you're after the fact and you're catching things after they've happened. This allows us to catch, um, catch anything we want well before uh, code commit, well, uh, sorry, at code commit or before, uh, well before it actually even gets deployed to a system. So source code takes the code, triggers a build of whatever we're talking about here. Our automation takes over, does some, uh, quick, fast, cheap testing, unit latent syntax, create a build, create an artifact. Again, I talked about that checksum being a key component. The artifact that we build or manage in our code here is really important to validating the integrity as we go through it. And then we can deploy to an environment. We can deploy directly to our testing environment. Um, we can deploy into staging. We can deploy into QA. And you, know, you can have two to or zero to 25 environments here, right? Um, your environment, your rules for what it looks like to get to the next stage is all inside of your, your structure. One of the things I see a lot as people try to go down this path is they take their existing big, heavy change review boards, right? And their, their change approvals at the cabs and say, okay, well, we're gonna create a pipeline and we're gonna put everything inside of it and we'll go. And you spend six months building this structure, building all the things, implementing it with the current review process. And you find that your pipeline is no faster it's because your review process isn't any faster, right? One of the things that's really important as we think about and go through these designs is what are the things we need to actually attest as we go through the security channels or go through the change channels of, about these things? Again, I have code commit, I have uh, build, and I have testing throughout the pipeline. I need to automate as much of the testing as possible, all the things around like, do we have uh, vulnerabilities in the code uh, scans? Are we using outdated libraries, right? All that kind of stuff needs to be there automatic, not having people involved. And then a human approval is really just to say, did the automation do its job correctly? Yes or no, right? Or if we're, especially if we're going to production and we're in a sensitive environment, are we in the appropriate window to run a production change, right? That's the kind of question we want to ask here. Um, and as we build them, we really actually want to say for the first First, while we're building this, we're really gonna put very, very little uh, roadblocks or gates in this process at all. Really, we want the two-person two rule at the front and maybe a human approval at production, and that's it. That's all we care about. Because if we're replacing things like SSH and RDP that are fast and easy and efficient, and people are really used to quickly getting to a system, getting the results that they want out of it and iterating, we need to make the process we're replacing it with exactly the same or as similar to that as possible so that people will build the muscle memory going, yep, I know that the way to make the change is to change the code, the code will then change the system for me. And as we go faster and get better, we can then add in more and more uh, pieces into it. We don't want to boil the ocean as we start off from this process. So 
So here's a slightly different view of what this can look like. Uh, and what the key idea here is that there's typically three major pieces of our environment that we're working with uh, from an operational and security level. There's the application stack. There is our security and audit and kind of, um, you know, what does the system look like from a security compliance perspective policy? And then there's the operations, you know, how do we build it? Uh, what do we need to manage from it? Um, if you're in, you know, Kubernetes and, and, and container lane, maybe this is offloaded. A lot of this stuff has been offloaded to your cloud provider, right? But there's some sort of management we have to do of, of that structure. Uh, if you're talking uh, Chef, this is where core Chef infra comes into play. It's the remediation side. Security comes out of our uh, compliance and inspect product, and then applications are or is the Habitat product. But the basic structure is that each object we're working with, regardless of what structure we're talking about here, if it's a uh, if it's a container, if it's a RPM, if it's a package, if it's honestly even just a script file, right? We create an artifact that is that thing, that code locked at a moment in time. Everything that it needs to run. That's the thing we build that goes to the pipeline and gets deployed to a trusted artifact store. The ideal way to run this in production is the fleet pulls from the artifact store. So what we have is we have a one-way flow from uh, development to the artifact store, and then we make a decision when the fleet is going to go grab the updated version from the artifact repository. This means that the artifact repository is the source of truth for what production looks like. Not necessarily the fleet, because the fleet is just grabbing from the source of truth. And then we can make sure we update that source of truth only through the pipeline, only with artifacts. And then again, locking the humans out of the process in the middle allows us to really attest that from a security and compliance perspective, this thing is in fact built the way we've said it's built. So why does all this matter? Why, why are we spending so much time thinking about security and compliance as part of this process? Galen keeps talking about audits. What's like, I'm just in operations or I'm in development. I don't, I don't know why I care about this. Well, we spent a lot of time working with security and compliance teams, uh, particularly trying to help uh, organizations adopt DevOps. And what we really find is that if security and compliance isn't on board and doesn't understand the new way in which we're going to make changes in production, the new speed at which we're going to operate, they end up being a really huge blocker to our uh, adopt, uh, adoption efforts. And one of the things we found as we started diving into what happens inside of an audit is that the state of the system, the actual just what is the current configuration of the thing in production, does it meet the rules, yes or no, is really just one part of it. How changes happen in the system is super critical. And a lot of time is spent on every audit documenting how did we get to where we are? How do we know that nothing else got into the uh, process in the middle of it that we didn't know about, right? And so this is really where the secure CI CD comes into play to say, look, I can prove to you exactly which code is in production and I can prove to you that the code never left my, my custody through this entire process. And so this allows us to attest to the integrity of the artifacts, which allows us to attest to the integrity of the system and uh, really by its nature gives us the structure of, of how do we, um, gives us the structure of how we made those changes as well. So that's, it's not quite self-documenting. We should, we should make sure to add some documentation to these audits, but really making sure that we understand like, hey, I don't have to go through like, it's, you know, Joe over in, you know, operations goes and actually runs the deploy. It's no, the deploy happens this way. These are the people who can authorize it. This is the validation that the people who are in the document list of who can authorize it are actually in the approved list on, in the repository as well. So again, uh, and the artifact is, again, the trusted artifact store is the source of truth. And this allows us for rebuild of production at any point in time. So by taking the things we're already doing from a DevOps perspective of the pipeline, building up uh, you know, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines, by adding in a couple components of how we think about and structure it, we've gained some serious security and compliance benefits, um, almost kind of as an afterthought. But these are the things we need to talk about when we go to security and compliance and say, hey, we're going to go do CI or CD. We're going to go faster. We're going to be shipping potentially multiple times a day or at least once or twice a week, right? Any of these structures that, that change the paradigm of how we think about uh, our production deployments really need security and compliance buy-in, and this is how we get it. So uh, an example, I don't have this up today. Uh, for many reasons, most notably of which uh, my Azure account is currently borked. Um, but this is the basic structure of what this looks like. And I, in my next slide, I will in fact have a link to the repository 
uh, where it does uh, it does work mostly. Um, so uh, please, uh, uh, some grains of salt if you go and take a look at this. But this is using Azure Git with Azure Pipelines. Uh, when I make a code commit to Azure Git, it triggers an automatic build. The build runs through some tests. Uh, it deploys to a VM that's listening to the artifact store. Um, in, in my case, it's a, a Habitat uh, Builder. Um, deploys and runs uh, any tests it has. And then there's a human approval gate to deploy to production. Uh, again, same thing, production is grabbing from the artifact store. And I have it set up with the pipeline such that I can't approve my own changes. Um, so only uh, another authorized user on the repository can actually make those changes. So to recap, humans really suck at routine tasks. We're, uh, let's be honest, folks, we're not good at them. I'm, I'm really bad at them. Maybe I'm lazy. Maybe I just hate inefficiency. Either way, I do my best to automate as much of my life as possible. We're really good at design, complexity, and co collaboration. So let's focus on providing the business value. Let's focus on making sure that we're doing positive things uh, in the world and in our space. Uh, let's design the systems that that uh, that work and do the uh, do the routine tasks for us. Robots, though, really great at routine tasks. Let's build some robots to go do routine things like pushing the button that brings the artifact to production. Robots still have to be designed by humans. AI is getting there, but still some humans are designing that stuff as well, right? The key component here that we can do is we can take the automation plus some security uh, ideas and constraints. We can create a human-free zone, which allows us to solve some uh, security compliance attestations we need to prove the integrity of our systems. And then again, here, here's an example of, of the pipeline for that to uh, work with. So like I said, uh, I certainly did not use up the full 45 minutes. And I would love to get uh, some questions and see what we can talk about. Yeah, thank you, Galen. Um, I actually do have a couple of questions for you. Um, so what are, do you have any specific examples of how automation worked for you? And you know, what problems did that solve? And maybe some examples of how automation failed. Sure. Yeah, so let's start with the failures. I think one of the most common ones in uh, in automating things, particularly in configuration management and operations uh, stacks, is I, just plenty of times where I've locked myself out of a system fully, right? Uh, and you know, by trying to implement this, uh, you know, not quite ready for SSH to go down, and and my automation comes in and hardens the system and removes it. And then all of a sudden, I have a, a black box to deal with, right? Um, and you know, that's that's always a little bit terrifying. It's why we don't run, you know, these changes directly in production. We test them first, and we we, we test them hard, um, uh, really effectively. But yeah, like that's really where the, the failures come in. Is is as you're going through this, you're going to run into gaps in either your knowledge or things are just complex enough that that it's hard to really get a, a good understanding of, of what it is before you make a change. Um, and you can definitely see those uh, those failures. Um, on the other hand, that's how we grow. That's one of the things I really like about this space and, and the, the areas we operate in. And this is where the successes come into play, which is that, look, I love the um, blameless postmortems. I love the retroactives. I love all of the things we do to make ourselves better and continue to challenge and grow on each other. And you only get those, I think, really well in organizations when we when we collaborate well and we go fast. Like it's it's move fast and break stuff, right? Like it's in the breakage that we we get to learn these things. And I think that's one of the key components of uh, of automation. One of the reasons why I really love the space um, and uh, why I've been passionate in my career for the last seven years. That's awesome. Um, thank you. So okay, a couple more. So then you mentioned Chef and Kubernetes earlier. Do you have any other tools that you use in, de in the DevSecOps pipelines? Yeah, so um, you know, pick a CI tool. Uh, uh, I'm a big fan of both GitLab and Azure Pipelines. They're both pretty pretty solid tools. Um, I haven't seen really anything be obnoxiously hard for anybody. Uh, Concourse was one we played with for a while. It was super simple to get going with. Really loved the interaction with that one. Um, obviously, all the hashy tools, Terraform is, is critical for managing cloud environments. Um, uh, obviously, I'm a big Chef fan. Um, but you know, like one of the things I, I've learned in my time at Chef is that uh, if you're an Ansible or Puppet or Salt fan, uh, look, be happy. Like all of the tools are really mature. They're all in a really good space. Um, I really don't think there's any reason uh, to continue to have turf wars over them. 
Um, really what we're focused on a lot now is the security compliance space. There's an audit and security testing component that's really lacking in environments. That's a really uh, key thing. Uh, Chef Inspect is the tool uh, on that side. Um, it's one of the things that I've been focused on a lot for the last two years. And it's just, uh, it's you know, really great, really great stuff. Um, what other things are in my stack? Uh, honestly, I'm a, I'm a Windows user too. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't run OS X. Uh, how what's well, Mac OS now? See, see how outdated I am on it. It's been, it's been a long time. Um, but so yeah, so like you know, uh, you know, I'm a big PowerShell fan. But honestly, Bash and and um, really for me, I think it's like things like Commander and um, uh, uh, Visual Studio Code. I was, it took me a minute to remember which uh, editor I use. But yeah, those those are all the key components there. And then awesome. And then last question for you. Um, this is more of a personal opinion question. Um, do you see a difference between using Azure versus AWS versus GCP? I, I think there's a little bit of difference between them. Obviously, they all operate a bit differently. I have found the hardest time going from AWS to Azure to understand how Azure thinks about networking. I think that was a, a, a kind of a there's a bit of the, just it operates differently. It's op and AWS feels much more traditional Cisco, like my brain manages the ACLs better. Um, I think we're starting to see the providers try to segment themselves into specific spaces, right? A little bit. I think um, both GCP and AWS are kind of fighting for some of that kind of like high compute, um, you know, um, really high load components. And Azure is doing a really good job of saying, hey, look, you really can't rely upon just one of those guys. Um, you really need to make sure you have uh, things going on. And obviously, Azure has done a great job with Office 365 and Azure AD. Um, most people I see are, are, are running those components as well. So so you kind of see some of those splits in, in, in the world. But uh, again, I'm very much a pick the ones you like. One of the things we tell our customers, and I, uh, I, I remember I've had a couple of good conversations on this, but I I had one with a pretty large customer who were like, yeah, we're going all in on AWS. And I were talking to him, look, that's a great, you know, it's fine. You know, great. We're happy to help you with that, that transition. However, you really need to understand, like, if AWS goes down, you your business is not running, right? Um, if you don't have a plan that backs you up somewhere, or if you're, um, we've seen things with, uh, this is years ago, but Custom Inc. had a big DDoS attack against them, and they got up and running in Rackspace in about three hours and got their business back online, right? So there's a disaster recovery and this and uh, kind of business continuation plan that I think we're still kind of lacking sometimes in the enterprise. And and sometimes, and literally the customer in question there told me, he's like, look, I'm pretty certain that I can sue it. You know, I can deal with AWS and my SLAs with AWS when that happens, but that's the risk I'm taking, right? They, they made a conscious risk for it. And I think that's one of the things we need to be clear on in this space is as we go to the cloud and as we remove more and more things from our control, from our data centers, we need to be very clear about the risk decisions we're making and who we're, uh, who we're making those with. So if you put your all your eggs in one basket, make sure you're you know you're doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can do it. Don't I mean like plenty of people do it. Also, just be aware that that's what you're you, what decision you're making, right? Right. That makes that makes sense to me. Um, awesome. Well, so far those are the only three questions that we had today. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, please feel free to send them now. Um, but I'll just have. Galen, do you have any other last minute comments? And then I'll just kind of do a last uh, spiel before we end. Uh, I just, thanks all for the time. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions, uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm not sure if I put it up anywhere. Galen underscore Emery. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, I'm sure my contact information is in my bio somewhere. But if not, I'm Galen Emery. Uh, there's really only one of me. Um, actually, it's not true. There's actually a, a skater kid out of Tacoma. So if you see anything weird on the internet, that's from him, not from me, promise. Uh, but yeah, I uh, really appreciate the time, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Awesome, yeah, thank you, Oh, wait, looks like there, thank... looks, there are some chats in some questions oh, perfect. in the chat. Hold on a second. Yeah, do you want me to read it out right. for you? Uh, looks like L Liron Benjamin said, mm -hmm. how do you handle things like secrets or config maps that you can't save anywhere in your source code? Yeah, secrets management is actually a really interesting space as well. Um, I recently ran into a group called Achilles. A uh, Achilles is, is is who they are, and they have a pretty clean competitor to HashiCorp's Vault. 
uh, that works really, uh, really interestingly. Um, one of the key things that like, I didn't talk about in this presentation is there's a lot of secrets that obviously have to get managed from database passwords and connection strings and you know yada yada yada. But one of the things that is we're we're seeing often is being abused in ransomware attacks in particular is actually your operational production credentials, right? Like the credentials that I would use to talk to production are the ones that the uh, attackers are using and then just running around grabbing a bunch of information before they decide to lock down the environment. And so this is one of the things around the human free pipeline is that if I don't ever have a production credential, like if that just doesn't exist, then nobody can grab that and use it against me to do nefarious things in my systems, right? I can't have an insider threat. I can't have an outside attacker grab my system. If my laptop gets stolen. There's nothing, you know, like the development credentials are there, but, you, but like, I don't necessarily have the same risk that I have as, as, as well. So you obviously need robust secrets management as part of any uh, robot, any real production system. Um, again, you can pick the vendor ones. Um, I'm a big fan of, of HashiVault and then Achilles is a really clean one as well that has, uh, I still don't fully understand exactly how they do it, but they have this distributed kind of key zero that they're, their original key they use that basically never gets combined, but still uses all the standard um, uh, well-proven uh, cryptography uh, to, to be secure. So, so there's some really key, uh, clean things there, but the basic structure of what we're talking about on secrets is um, the only things that should get to them are the automation. Uh, so like have the automation set up to, to grab the secrets appropriately. Um, this is where your uh, API-based secrets management is really, really keen or uh, king. And, uh, you know, really reduce, eliminate, remove the human access to those secrets. In fact, in fact one of my colleagues at Chef, Nathan Cerny, really talks a lot about a break glass thing, right? You know, we talk about this human free pipeline and I go to customers and I've got a few customers who, who really do do this fully, who really don't have any production access, um, a lot of cloud native, a lot of Kubernetes in those environments. But if we're talking about existing legacy systems, we're not going to get there tomorrow, right? And so what we've done is we set up basically a break glass situation where you go into secrets management and check out the very clear the production credentials. And then after you're done, those credentials get rotated, right? Um, so that we know exactly who got in and when, and we can track all that information. Liren, hopefully that answered your question for you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.